Well if it isn't Barrio. How are you doing? I'm great Sakko, but I'm in a real hurry. Why? What's going on? I'm headed downtown to organize the Occupy rally and don't want to be late. Rally? Sounds important. What's it about? It's to bring down the capitalist bastards who are destroying this country. Well, it is always good to stop people who are causing harm, especially if they are doing harm to our country. Damn straight. Can you help me understand how these capitalists are hurting our country? I would, but I really gotta get going. I understand. But can't you stay a little while to explain? I am not an intellectual like you. I don't easily understand complex matters, but want to learn the truth about what is best for our country. Well, it is important to enlighten the masses. Perhaps you can educate me over a coffee. Well, this chain's drinks are chill. Somehow they're consistently good at all their stores. Excellent. Let's go inside and order. Barista, may I have a small coffee, please? And I'll have an extra large, half-calf, low-fat, double-shot mocha frappe with whipped cream. Wow. You really know a lot about coffee. Now let us sit down so you can enlighten me about the capitalists. Well, they are the most evil people around. They are the greedy, self-serving, rich who only think about themselves and they harm the people. Well, if they are doing evil, they should certainly be stopped. Please explain how they do harm to our country. They rip everyone off and selfishly keep all of the money for themselves, while 99% of the people get poorer. The rich don't pay their fair share, and we must make them so we can help the poor. So your goal is to have the rich forfeit their money, and to redistribute it to those who are not rich? Exactly. So you are looking for us to have equal outcomes in our society? rather than equal opportunity. What do you mean? I want both, aren't they the same thing? I don't think so. In a race, equal opportunity would require every runner to start from the same starting line, allowing the most skilled and dedicated runner to win the race. Equal outcome would guarantee that all runners cross the finish line at the same time, regardless of the runner's skill and effort. I hear you, but in our society not everyone starts at the same place. Many are disadvantaged and don't have the benefits of the well-off, who are starting way ahead of everyone else. So given such disparities, you were saying you prefer for all of the runners to finish the race together, for our society to ensure that everyone has the same or similar rewards. Exactly. That's the way it should be. That certainly sounds positive. It would be interesting if the Cubs could always win the World Series, or do so occasionally, or at least once this century. I am a White Sox fan, but I hear you. So you want a society where everyone enjoys the same outcomes, the same wealth and benefits. Right. And if you want everyone to have the same rewards, do we not first need to determine how to achieve this outcome? Absolutely. So help me understand more about these rich people. If we discover how they made their money, perhaps we can determine how everyone can make money and then there will not be any more of the poor people we are so concerned with helping. Hold on. That's not it at all. Don't go there. We don't want to make everyone do the grubby things the rich do to make money. That would be awful. Why is that? Because capitalists do terrible things. They don't care about the people. They only care about making money on their money off of the backs of the people. They destroy our environment, sell junky products, and constantly rip off the people. They are criminals. Well that sounds terrible. Who exactly are the worst offenders? They are the 1% to make the most money. So you mean professional athletes and movie stars? I always had a feeling that this Sean Penn fellow was up to no good. No, no, no. Sean Penn and the other celebrities are cool. They aren't ripping off the people. They provide entertainment for everyone. They are the good guys, not the enemy. Oh, that is good to hear. I would not want the celebrities to forfeit their mansions since they contribute so much to the public good. After all, they produce high-quality television shows and movies like Jackass and G. Lee. But I still have my doubts about this Sean Penn fellow. And I am still missing something. What's that? You said those earning the most in our society are making money on their money and ripping off the people. I have read that Hollywood stars and professional athletes make many millions of dollars each year. Why don't you want to protest against them? They should be taxed more, but they aren't the real problem. They are not trying to screw the people. Most of them support the people's struggle, 
So the real problem isn't all of the richest people per se, but only some of them? That's correct. If your concern is only a portion of the rich, how do we know which of the rich are good and which are bad? The bad ones are the capitalists who are screwing the people. Hmm. Perhaps you are saying that the problem is not that some people are rich and others are poor, but the way in which some people make their money. That's right. So you are okay with actors, athletes and others who make much more money than most people if they are not making their money in ways you consider inappropriate. Provided they pay their fair share in taxes. Before discussing what you mean by fair share, can you tell me who are the rich capitalists you believe are causing all of the problems? It's the bankers and big businessmen who are ripping off the people. So is everyone who is wealthy, who works in a banker business, bad? No, no, no. Not all of them. You really don't know much, do you? I am sorry to say I am not an intellectual like you. Didn't I mention this before? The bad guys are bankers who loan money those who invest money, and heads of multinational corporations. Greedy capitalists who make too much money and get bailouts. It's the 1% who are ripping off everyone. If they are ripping everyone off, as you say, why can't we have them arrested for theft? The bankers and businessmen don't literally steal, they do scummy things that they are allowed to do under capitalism. If they had broken laws they could be prosecuted. But if they are not breaking any laws, why do you believe what they are doing is wrong? They're capitalists. The bankers take money from the people, give it to their fat cat business friends who sell overpriced crap to the people, and then split the profits with the bankers. The way you describe it, capitalism sounds very clubby. Exactly. The fat cats helping one another and screwing the people. Rich bankers give money to their rich business friends and make more and more money off of the backs of the working man. That's why it's called crony capitalism. It's really not a fair system. I agree that fairness is very important, even though we have yet to define it. But I am still missing something very basic. What's that? It is not clear to me how these capitalists are doing evil. If you can clarify this, perhaps I can better understand how to stop them from harming our country. Like I said, the bankers and businessmen are all just scheming bastards. It is the essence of what they do. As best I understand commercial banking. People deposit money in banks in exchange for earning interest on the money they deposit. That's right. Commercial banks generate revenue by lending depositors money to others in exchange for an obligation to pay back loans with interest. The bankers often require borrowers to pledge collateral as insurance in the event of default. Is that right? Yeah. The interest rate borrowers pay to banks is greater than the interest rate the banks pay depositors. Is that true as well? That's right. And the borrower's loan payments are used by the bank to pay the depositor's principal and interest and to cover the bank's expenses, such as employee salaries. If there is any money left over a profit is generated. Is that right? Yeah. Those bastard capitalists are driven by the profit motive and suck the blood out of the 99%. That is why they are evil. So you believe the commercial bankers are evil because they seek a profit? They only care about themselves and their money. They could care less about broader society. Yet, through seeking a profit, aren't the commercial bankers benefiting society? What do you mean? They're just trying to make money off of the backs of the people. Perhaps. Though in addition to paying interest to depositors, the money they lend out to individuals and companies is used to purchase homes and build businesses that hire people who produce products and services that the people want. Well, that's true. But many of the products produced by corporations are bad for society. You mean like cell phones, television sets, and other consumer goods? No, no, not those things. They benefit society. Well, what then? Multinational corporations make tons of crap that no one needs and harm our environment, like the pollution generated by the big oil companies. Most companies are just like the bankers, they are not socially conscious. Yet if the people do not want the products and services these companies make, how do the companies stay in business? The people may want what the companies make, but that doesn't mean the people should want what the companies produce. Oh, you mean like the large-sized sugary drinks I have been hearing about? Exactly. Yet do not the people in our society have the right to purchase what they want? Well, if what they want is bad for them, they shouldn't have that right. Why do you feel this way? Because if things they want are unhealthy they could be harming themselves by consuming them. Yet in a free society, 
Do not adults have a right to do harm to themselves? Maybe, but by doing so they also put an added strain on the healthcare system. So are you saying that people should not be free to choose for themselves because if they make poor choices, there may be a cost to society? That's right. Those who know better than the masses should be empowered to decide what is best for all of the people. Well, I agree with you that the individuals may not always know what is best. Yet I am not certain that most adults believe that others know what is better for them, or that others should have the power to make decisions on their behalf. Well, we need to educate the masses to understand that this is what they should want. By empowering a select few individuals to decide for them? That's what our democracy is all about. That is an interesting view of the purpose of our representative democracy. Well, government gives rights to the people, doesn't it? Actually, in our Declaration of Independence, the Founders wrote that the people's rights are inalienable, and given to them by their Creator, rather than given to the people by government. Are you sure about that? That is what I have read. Wow! What an outdated way of looking at things! Furthermore, in our Republic, the people give select powers to government in order for it to uphold and protect the people's rights, as outlined in the Declaration and in the Bill of Rights. Well, that's old school. The way people thought about things in olden times. Those are the ideas of dead, white men, who came here from Europe. The laws need to change with the times. Even if it means infringing on the people's rights? We need to do what is best for the people, whether they understand it or not. And one of your concerns is that the poor consumption decisions made by individuals can negatively impact the health care system? Yeah. Because nowadays the government needs to pay for the people's health care. Well, if people choose to live an unhealthy life, should not they pay the price for their own mistakes, rather than having society as a whole do so? Health care decisions are too complicated to leave to the masses. That is why the government needs to run the health care system and limit people from doing harm to themselves. So you believe we should let government decide what people can and cannot acquire, and prevent companies from producing and selling things that government officials decide are bad for people? Yeah. If the people want to do unhealthy things, the government should protect them from themselves. We should do what Bloomberg is trying to do, but on a massive scale. So you are saying government should make decisions for the people even if it limits the people's freedom because the people are not capable of making such decisions for themselves? That is exactly what I am saying. The average guy does not know what is best for him. He needs government to make decisions for him. I am not certain this is what the people want. Yet can you explain why you believe government knows what is better for the people than the individuals themselves? Listen, most people are not highly educated and the government bureaucracy is made up of enlightened intellectuals who think about what is best for others, like the policy makers in our Justice Department. You mean the bureaucrats who initiated Operation Fast and Furious? The program that gave hundreds of guns to smugglers that ended up in the hands of Mexican drug dealers, and were ultimately used in many crimes, including the killing of a U.S. Border Control agent. Well, even enlightened people can make a mistake or two. But that is not important. What is important is to know who knows what's best for others. These bureaucrats must be very bright if they know the needs of each of the 314 million people in this country. They are. Perhaps you are saying we should have the government make all important decisions for the people, if they are not capable of making the right choices for themselves. We should. Like in China, where the government determines how many children one may have, what books one may read, and what job one may hold. Now. We don't want to appear extreme. Well, if you believe government workers know what is best, why not advocate forfeiting all of our rights so government can have the power to make all important decisions? Well, that may be too much change for the people at first. They may not be able to handle that much improvement at once. Ah, so you are advocating moving in this direction, but suggest an incrementalist approach toward increasing government control over the people. Yes. Starting with health care. You got it. So the government can prevent people from having the freedom to consume what is bad for them. Right. Like recreational drugs. What is your problem, man? Drugs aren't the issue. It is all of the fattening crap that obese people eat. Oh, so you are saying that our country has a problem with obesity but not drug addiction. I didn't say that. What did you say? Listen, it's not like everyone who takes drugs is a drug addict. Is everyone who drinks sugary drinks obese? Obesity is a big problem in our country. Well, 
Just like some people who have the problem of eating too much, don't other people consume drugs in dangerous quantities? Hey, most people think there is no problem with a little weed now and then. Most people are in addicts. In fact, government is starting to liberalize the restrictive, barbaric drug policies in our country. Yes it is. Though now I am puzzled as to the rationale for some potentially dangerous consumable to be legal and others to be illegal. I am getting the sense that such policy decisions could be somewhat arbitrary, and based on the subjective perspective of whoever has the power to make such determinations. Forget about drugs, and don't concern yourself with such details. This is clearly too complicated a subject to explain to you. Perhaps so. Oh well, I am glad to hear that we have intelligent, gold-sold government officials trying to make these decisions on our behalf. What do you mean by gold-sold? Oh, it is just a term I picked up somewhere. What I meant is that I am glad we have intelligent government officials, with the people's best interests at heart, making such important decisions for them. You should be. And remind me. Why do you recommend an incremental approach to having the people give up their freedoms? Because the people would realize what was happening and might oppose our plans. Anyhow, I don't call it taking away freedoms, I call it having government take care of the people for their own good. And how do you get the people to give up more and more of their rights? Er, I mean, allow the government to do more and more for the people for their own good. It's all about going slowly, and how you explain it. You don't want to emphasize what people are giving up, you need to focus on what they're getting. Can you give me an example? Sure. We need to tell the people to support universal health care because it will provide everyone in our society with access to medical care. We want to avoid focusing on the details, like the fact that it will mandate everyone to purchase medical insurance. Or that it may lead to rationing of medical services, since it will cause greater demand for limited services? We don't know that will occur for a fact. Well, I have read that in countries with free government health care, like in Canada and Western Europe, there are long waits for surgeries and other essential treatments because there are not enough resources to meet everyone's real-time needs. Well, maybe the kinks aren't out of their programs. Anyhow, the broader point is that the goal of communication is to convey a simple, direct, positive message. It's not to get into hypothetical policy concerns that can confuse the people and lead them to question your position. Because if you provide both sides of an issue it might result in the people opposing the policy you are trying to implement. Yeah. Most people are not enlightened enough to understand that government mandates are for their own good. But over time, they will learn to live with more and more government controls. It will become habitual. So people will get used to living with less and less freedom over time. Of course, as long as we keep promising them something in return and explain that it is for their own good. Perhaps. Though if greater and greater government authority is what people want, it is surprising that so many people wish to immigrate to our country from places with significant government control, while few Americans wish to emigrate to countries with fewer freedoms. Most people just don't know what's good for them. That is an interesting take on things. I now understand your view of the desired role for government, but still do not understand why commercial bankers are evil. Look. When bankers lend to big corporations they make huge profits and keep most of the money for themselves. Meanwhile, they pay unfair rates of interest to depositors, and charge high rates of interest to the average guy who takes out a mortgage. If banks are so profitable, why are there so many bank failures? What do you mean? My understanding is that banks are currently failing at a very high rate. If we reduce the profit margins of the remaining banks won't we generate more bank failures? Who says banks are failing? I have read that between 2008 and 2011 over 400 banks in the United States failed. Could be, but if they are failing it serves those greedy capitalists right. Yet if all of the bankers are making money, why are their banks failing? Beats me. Maybe they found better ways to gouge the people. My understanding is that banks go out of business if a large percentage of borrowers do not pay them back and the value of their collateral is insufficient to cover the amount of their outstanding loans. Could be. Yet why wouldn't borrowers pay back the money they are lent? They probably can't afford to pay the high interest rates on their mortgages and other loans. Maybe the banks that went out of business did so because they gave too much money to those who were poor credit risks, 
like companies and individuals that did not have the means to pay off their loans and mortgages in the first place. Could be, but who cares? Well, it is curious that so many banks have failed in the past four years, since in the two years prior to 2008 no commercial banks failed in America. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Perhaps, but it seems like a pretty big coincidence. Could it be that something changed to compel banks to alter their lending practices? Who cares? If you wish, we can examine the reasons for so many recent bank failures on another day. Yet for our current discussion, is it not true that if banks go out of business it impacts not only the bankers, but also their depositors? That is where government comes in. They make successful banks take over failed banks and insure depositors against losses to federal deposit insurance. We should certainly explore whether the government coming in to bail out depositors and help consolidate banks really solves the problem. Yet if bankers are going out of business in large numbers, and therefore many are not making large profits, I still do not understand why you believe commercial bankers are evil. Well, it is not that all of the banks are so bad. Our real focus needs to be on the big guys, the banks that are too big to fail. They make most of their money through investment banking activities, obscenely profitable investments in all sorts of things other than loans. Together with the big, multinational corporations they make crazy profits at the expense of the people. Ah, so now you are saying our real concern should not be most of the commercial banks. I guess our biggest enemies are the investment banks. The big commercial banks that engage in investment banking activities and the multinational corporations. Then we should certainly discuss investment banking and multinational corporations, if they are the real focus of your anger. Although I fear we have not fully examined bank lending practices and the consequences of their failure, which may not prove to be trivial. We can come back to that. But first let's talk about how the investment bankers are screwing the people. I am not sure about all of the particulars. But I know they are doing evil things at the expense of the people. My understanding is that investment bankers acquire and provide funds to companies in exchange for an ownership interest that may include a say in how the company is run. The bankers make money by packaging and selling these ownership stakes to investors, as well as by investing their own funds in the companies. The investors hope to make money if the company is successful and anticipate losing money if the company does poorly. Yeah. I guess that's right. They take a stake in companies so they can lay off workers and strip off and sell assets. They could care less about the little guys working at the companies. I agree that investment bankers may not be motivated by a concern for the little guy, but I think they actually help the little guy even though that is not their goal. How's that? Let's take as an example the coffee chain where we are today. It is now a multinational business that originally took money from investment bankers to grow. Is this not correct? I suppose so, but I really don't see where you are going. This place makes good coffee and gives money to support the rainforest. It's not a bad place. Although they do charge too much for a latte. Well then, did not something good come out of the investment bankers taking the risk of investing their funds in this coffee business? What risk? Since most businesses fail, the bankers who invested in this business risked their funds in the hope that this business would succeed. But what good did they do, except for themselves? Well, if they did not provide funding, this coffee company could not have opened up all of its stores, and people would not have had the opportunity to enjoy this great, consistently made coffee at all of the locations you solicit. I guess that's right. And all of these locations employ dozens and dozens of workers, not to mention all of the people who are employed to grow coffee, and to make other products this company sells. Yeah. But the bankers who originally gave them money made an obscene profit on their investment, because now this chain is worth a fortune. Perhaps, but they also took a large risk. If this chain failed, the bankers would have had very little to show for their investment. So by taking a great risk, they succeeded in reaping a large return. I guess so. And when a company becomes really successful, it uses the investment bankers to allow the broader public to make a profit, as well. How do they help the public profit? Many companies that start out as small, private ventures decide upon becoming somewhat successful, to be taken public. This means company ownership stakes are offered for sale to the public in the form of stock. This stock can be purchased by anyone, including pension fund managers who invest the retirement funds of all sorts of people, 
such as union workers. Yeah, well it seems to me that it's all just a scam to allow the bankers and business owners to reap huge profits for themselves. Going public is done to turn a profit for the company and its advisors, yet it also allows the average guy to make a profit as well, such as by allowing you to invest in the firm that made your cell phone. I have read that your cell phone company's stock has gone up several times its original value since its shares were first issued. Yeah, but not all stocks go up. Right, and investment bankers don't turn a profit from all companies in which they invest. One takes a risk by investing, and don't we want people to have the freedom to take such risks? I'd rather the people had fewer risks. We should want to make society as safe and risk-free as possible. Yet risk leads to progress. If the coffee shop owner did not take the risk of trying to open a chain, you would not have benefited from being able to get this great coffee at so many locations. I guess so. And if the investment banker and other investors didn't take the risk of investing in the coffee company, they would not have turned a profit upon the coffee chain succeeding. Well their profits are too large. The banker screwed the owner of the coffee shop, because the coffee shop owner had to give up part of his ownership stake to the bankers. Yet if the person who started this coffee chain did not borrow money from the bankers, or other investors, how would he have had enough money to build a large coffee chain that serves you this great coffee at so many locations? Well, the government could have given him a loan, and I am certain they would have given him one with much better terms than those bastard bankers did. I am not certain it is so easy to get a government-backed loan, or that the funds provided would be sufficient to build such a large coffee chain. Yet. Let us nevertheless assume that our entrepreneur could acquire such a loan of sufficient size from the government. Who would ultimately be funding such a loan? What do you mean? The government, of course. And who pays for the government? I guess the taxpayers. I agree. The taxpayers ultimately pay for government loans. Doesn't that mean that more people are putting their money at risk than if a bank makes a loan? What do you mean? You said before that you want things to be less risky for the average person, yet you seem to be proposing the opposite. How's that? Well, in the case of a bank loan, if the person or business taking out the loan cannot pay it back, then the bank is on the hook. In the case of a government loan, if the business cannot pay back the loan then all taxpayers are on the hook. That may be true, but I trust the government to invest wisely. Anyhow. You are forgetting that the businesses that get all of this funding are gouging the people. Like I said, this place charges too much for a coffee. Isn't there a coffee shop across the street that charges less for a coffee? Yeah. Why don't you go there? Because their coffee sucks. Why is that? They do not use a state-of-the-art latte machine, and they do not have high-grade Arabica beans, and their workers don't know how to engage in pleasant small talk while you are waiting for your coffee. Well... Doesn't it cost this chain more money to use a state-of-the-art latte machine and to purchase better beans, and perhaps to hire a better, more conversant staff? I suppose. So isn't it possible that the stores in this chain charge more because it costs them more to make a cup of coffee the way you like it? I guess. And doesn't it follow that if the store across the street sells a less pleasing cup of coffee than their competition then they may need to charge less for it in order to make a sale? or to attract a different clientele who are seeking to spend less on their coffee? I suppose so, but this chain still charges too much. Yet if this chain charged so much for its coffee that people stopped coming here, and instead went to a competitor who charged less, wouldn't they need to either lower their prices, increase their quality or otherwise find a way to attract their lost customer base in order to stay in business? That could be. But unless the government steps in and orders them to stop charging so much and making such huge profits, who is going to stop them? My understanding is that that is where competition comes into play. What do you mean? In a free market, if a firm is generating an extremely large profit, it is in short order joined by competitors who often drive down prices. How? For products and services that sell based on price. Competitors often offer to provide a similar product for less money in the hopes of attracting customers. If they are successful in taking business away from the original provider, this can result in a price war, where each company drops prices until they cannot afford to lower them any further and still stay in business. So in a real sense, prices are set by the marketplace, by the people. Huh? Well then I hope this chain gets some more competition real soon. Yes. We agree that monopolies are not a good thing.
it seems competition limits the amount of profit a company can make, unless the company is able to offer a product or service that others cannot easily replicate. I guess that is a good thing. Well, good or bad, it is the result of competition. But you are making it sound like competition is all good. What concerns you? Competition may have its benefits, but it also leads to people losing their jobs. Like when a coffee shop goes out of business because it makes coffee people don't like. Exactly. So what you're saying is that competition forces businesses to innovate in order to offer products and services at a price and with a level of quality and convenience that appeals to consumers, and that if they fail to do so, they will go out of business. Right. But if a business fails to be competitive, don't you want them to go out of business? Maybe, but I don't want people to lose their jobs. Yet by working in businesses, even those that eventually fail, workers develop skills and build resumes that they can leverage to acquire employment at other businesses, hopefully ones that will prove successful. That is true, but sometimes people who are doing their best still lose their jobs and cannot find employment. Such as when there is a bad economy. Yeah. We agree. It is important for us to have a full discussion about what makes for a growing economy so that there are jobs available for everyone seeking employment. But for now, since you are pressed for time, would it be alright if we get back to completing our discussion about the bankers and investors who provide funds to companies, such as coffee shops? Like I said, the investment bankers are the real criminals. They only care about making a profit. And why is this a bad thing if they are concurrently providing benefits to others? Is it because the bankers are seeking to make money? Yeah, they make tons of money and only give it to the companies they think will make them the most money, and not often to firms that are socially conscious. Ah, like the race we were discussing before, not everyone runs equally well, so you want to find a way for everyone to reach the finish line at the same time, to be equally successful. That's right. Oh. Hold on a second, I am getting a phone call. Hello? Oh bummer. Well, when will they be there? Okay, okay, yeah, I'll see you in an hour. Is everything alright? Yeah, it seems Joe B, this guy who was supposed to tell everyone about the rally, gave them the wrong time, so everything is pushed back a couple of hours. I knew we should not have trusted Joe B. Everyone knows he's a screw up. That is what I have been told. Next time, I'll use someone who I believe can do a good job. How unfortunate. It is terrible when you bet on someone who cannot produce, especially when you know he is likely to fail. Yeah, what a pain in the butt. Well, since you now have a bit more time, may I buy you a refill? That would be great. Barista, I'll have another extra large, half-calf, low-fat, double-shot mocha frappe with whipped cream. Now, where were we? We were discussing how you want to make sure that the bankers treat everyone the same, instead of only investing in companies that they think will be successful. Well, it shouldn't all be about money. They should help out socially conscious companies too. So explain what you propose the bankers do. If there are several companies that want to sell coffee, should the bankers give funding to all of them, rather than solely the companies they think will succeed? Or, should they be obligated to give money to coffee shops that are socially conscious, who pay their employees a high wage, try to hire disadvantaged youth, source their beans from countries in need of revenue, and commit to using green products? They should help the green companies. And what should the bankers do if some of the green companies they invest in start to fail? I don't know. I guess provide them with more money to help them out until they can succeed. And what should the bankers do if a company they invest in is not able to succeed no matter how much money they invest in it? Look, I'm not a numbers guy. Okay, but would it be fair for the bankers to help out the failing company forever? I guess not, but they need to act responsibly. Hmm. You mean like being responsible for finding a job for Joe B? A job that he can perform better than telling people what time a rally is taking place? Hey, listen. That's his problem. He's on his own. I am six of his screw-ups. I gave him several shots and each time he blew it. I agree with you. It would be wrong for you to be responsible for propping him up forever. I guess bankers feel the same way, because they avoid investing in companies they think will fail, and cut off those companies that prove to be failures even if they originally thought they might be successful. Well, I guess that makes sense.
So we agree it is reasonable for the bankers to avoid investing in every corporation, or to continue to provide money to companies that prove to be bad bets. Yeah, but you don't understand. It's not that simple. Why is that? The bankers are corrupt. Your example doesn't hold because they only lend to their rich friends and screw the little guy. Is that right? Yes. Bankers only give money to big multinational businesses that are run by their rich friends. You mean like the small groups of people who originally invented the sleek personal computer? Or who created that social networking website? Or who started that company that lets you purchase books online? No, not them. They're cool companies that started out small. But did they not get money from bankers to help them grow and expand their businesses? I never really thought about it that way. But I'm sure most of the money banks give out is to big companies that do bad things, like weapons manufacturers and oil companies that pollute. Investment banks certainly provide funds to large corporations and many industries, yet they also fund startup companies that grow into large corporations, like this coffee chain that started out as a single shop. Well, maybe the bankers have a soft spot for certain companies and not others. I don't think so. As I understand it, before committing funds, investment bankers examine the quality of firms' ideas and review the soundness of their business plans, which outline their approach to succeed in the competitive marketplace. So the bank's investments are not arbitrary, even if they are not egalitarian. Is this your understanding? I don't know how they make their investment decisions, but I suppose what you say makes sense. I think you were right before when you said that bankers are motivated by wanting to make a profit. They are not investing money out of altruism, friendship, or the wealthiness of those seeking investments. They simply invest to make a profit. That's right. You can't forget that they're money-hungry bastards. Now, you have said that you would like banks to invest in companies with high-minded purposes. Right. And we already said that bankers are willing to invest in companies from whom they think they can make a profit. Yeah. So the bankers are not averse to investing in companies with high-minded purposes, only those that they think will not be profitable. I guess so. So, if there are companies with high-minded purposes that banks choose not to invest in, it is because they do not think such investments will be profitable, not because they object to the companies being high-minded. Yeah. And what would happen if the banks invested in too many companies that didn't succeed, and they failed to make a profit over time? What do you mean? The bankers would make less money and not be richer than most people. That would be great. Yet would not it also mean that there would be less money available for other startup companies seeking funding? Could be. And wouldn't this reduce the number of new, innovative products and services coming into the marketplace? Maybe. Well would not that be bad news for the average person, the consumer? If the products are good ones, yes. Therefore. It is not necessarily in the average person's interest for the investment bankers to be unsuccessful. Well, maybe not. Can we return to the commercial bankers? Because I don't think we ever finished our discussion about what happens when they fail. If you have to. We said that if banks lose so much money that they don't have funds to pay back their depositors, they could go out of business and fail to pay back their depositors, including the common people. Right, but the government would bail them out. Remember I mentioned federal deposit insurance? I do, and I agree that if a limited number of banks fail the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has sufficient funds to bail out depositors. Yet if too many banks are unable to pay back their depositors, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is funded by banks themselves, would not have enough money to make all depositors whole. What do you mean? The government can pay for anything it wants. We just have to make sure to elect socially conscious politicians who will spend less on war and subsidizing the rich. The government needs to spend more on taking care of the people. Yet the government does not have access to infinite funds. Government gets its money from taxing businesses and the people, as well as borrowing. Is that right? Yeah, and that's why we have to tax the rich more. We have to be fair and make sure that the government has enough to spend on the 99%. My understanding is that government spending far exceeds what is paid in taxes. Even if the top 1% of earners paid all of their income to government, the taxes collected would only be enough to pay for about one third of the $3.7 trillion federal budget. Well, don't forget that other people pay taxes too. Actually, it turns out that 40% of the people pay little to no federal income tax, 
and many citizens receive far more money from the federal government than they pay. Well, the people who are hurting should be helped by government. You will be glad to know that two out of five Americans are being so helped, or at least, are not contributing to our budget through paying federal taxes. Well, there are a lot of other Americans. It turns out that most of the other 60% of our citizens contribute very little to income tax revenues. What do you mean? According to the Tax Foundation, the top 1% of earners pay a bit under 40% of all federal income taxes, and the top 5% of earners pay almost 60% of all federal income taxes. Good. I am glad to hear that the rich are getting soaked. Then you will also be glad to hear that the bottom 95% of earners, the overwhelming majority of Americans, collectively pay less in taxes than the top 5% of earners. The rich are paying a very large percentage of all of federal spending. They can afford it. Even more surprisingly, the top 50% of earners pay 97.7% of all federal income taxes. The bottom half of American earners pay only 2.3% of income taxes. Huh? I didn't know that. And sadly, it is not enough. What do you mean? Even with wealthier Americans paying all of this money in income taxes, it is still not nearly enough to cover the cost of our federal government. How's that? To cover all needed government spending requires significant borrowing. Isn't that true? Could be. Like I said, I really don't focus on this accounting stuff. I fully understand. Yet it seems that in 2011 the government deficit for that year alone was $1.3 trillion. Coincidentally, the same amount as the gross revenues of the top 1% of earners. So? Well, it is interesting that even if the 1% were taxed all of the money that they earn in a year it would only cover the federal government's current annual deficit, not any of the government's other current spending. I guess we need more rich people. That would be helpful. Yet you have advocated that we reduce the number of rich bankers, and for some reason I do not believe that promising to take more of the remaining rich people's money will incent them to take the risks needed to make money. And unfortunately, increases in government expenditures and the softening of the economy over the past four years have gone hand in hand with a sharp drop in the number of rich in our country. Sadly, this has led to even more government borrowing. Well I am glad we are sticking it to the wealthy and that the government can borrow what it needs for any shortfalls. And from whom does the government borrow? I'm not quite sure. Who cares? Well, I have read that the way the government borrows is largely through issuing bonds and other interest-bearing debt instruments that they sell to investors, like the treasuries other countries and rich people in our own country buy. Okay, that's great. It's good to know that there are a few capitalists and enlightened leaders in other countries who are socially conscious enough to help us out when we need a hand. Well, if I understand their motives, the reason they purchase our treasuries is because they think they have a better chance of getting paid back than if they invest in other alternatives, such as the securities of other countries. So their motives don't seem to be altruistic, but rather based on self-interest. Well, I am sure you are wrong. Enlightened countries, and a few socially enlightened capitalists, are just trying to help us out because they are good people. There is one big reason why I don't think this is the case. What's that? Well, the largest of the countries purchasing treasuries have told us that they are going to buy fewer and fewer over time. They have already cut back on their purchases because they think we are borrowing too much and it is harming the value of our currency. Well, as long as we can make it through the present. What a noble way to look at things. Unfortunately, we have already come to a point where other countries and investors are not sufficiently investing in our government's treasuries. I read that this is partly due to investors having superior investment alternatives, but mainly because our cumulative debt has grown to such a large amount, about $16 trillion, that there are not enough willing investors to buy it all up. Our debt even exceeds the amount of all goods and services we produce in a year known as our gross domestic product. What is government doing to deal with this problem? The government always has a good answer, as long as it's not controlled by the right-wing fascists. Well, based on what I have read, to purchase the debt instruments it cannot sell in the marketplace, the federal government is selling these treasury instruments to the U.S. Central Bank. They, in turn, are printing more of our currency to purchase these securities. They call this monetizing the debt. That's terrific. It certainly deals with the immediate shortfall, 
Yet my understanding is that there are significant consequences to the government having more and more dollars printed. Hey man, I don't care. As long as we can take care of today's needs. We can worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. You know what I mean? Yes. Unfortunately, I know exactly what you mean. Yet, if the government deficit continues to grow larger and larger, and the government cannot raise sufficient taxes to cover the interest on the debt, on top of its spending on ever-expanding government programs, how will we pay for all of these bailouts, let alone the ongoing cost of government? Like I said, I am not an accountant. I am sure things will work themselves out. We just need to elect enlightened, socially conscious leaders. You worry too much. So you are saying that we should just have faith that the people's needs will be taken care of if we let others make the decisions for us, rather than taking responsibility for ourselves. Something like that. That is certainly one approach. Though I am not certain it will end in a positive way. Whatever, can we get back to discussing the bankers? Sure. You started out by saying the bankers were evil for making money, yet we discussed that if they did not try to make profits, they would neither fund the growth of businesses, such as this coffee chain, nor would they have the money necessary to pay back principal and interest to those who deposited their funds in banks. Yeah. So is it really evil of them to try to make a profit? Well, I guess not. But it is evil of them to gouge people by making unfair, large profits. It leads to a few people having more money than the masses. Well, as with the coffee shops, are not the banks subject to competition? If they can still make a profit doing so, cannot other banks open to compete with them and thereby drive down rates at which they loan funds? You don't understand. It's a rigged deck. The bankers can borrow from the Federal Reserve Bank, and the big banks make risky investments in derivatives and other exotic instruments because it's house money. And why are these banks able to make these risky investments? Because they know the government will bail them out if they lose money. So you are saying that the root cause of risky bank investments is the banker's belief that the government will help them if their investments fail, similar to the depositors believing that government will help them if the banks lose their deposits. It's not just a belief. The government established a TARP fund to bail out banks and other financial companies that were in trouble. So what you are saying is the reason banks choose to make risky investments is that they have a good reason to believe that they will be bailed out. Exactly. By the government? Right. So the reason that banks are not acting as responsibly as they might otherwise is because of the government? Well, the government has no choice. Why is that? Because if the government doesn't bail them out, then even more banks could go out of business and force even more of their depositors to be bailed out. That is certainly one way of looking at things. However, if the banks did not believe they had the government to rely on to bail them out when they made risky investments, might they not choose to invest more responsibly in the first place? Why? Do not the bankers want to stay in business? Sure. And if they lose lots of money over time, are they able to stay in business? No. If they make investments with lower risk, aren't they more likely to make a stable profit, even if it is a small one, than if they make risky investments? Sure. And if they make risky investments, with the goal of making a big return, aren't they more likely to lose money? I guess so. And if no one is willing to bail them out when they sustain losses, doesn't it increase the likelihood that they will go out of business if they invest a large proportion of their funds in risky investments that often go sour? I guess so. But if they have someone willing to bail them out, doesn't this remove the risk of making large, risky investments? Yeah. And might this therefore encourage their making risky investments? Because they realize that if they are successful in their investments they will make a larger return than by making non-risky investments. Yet if they lose money making risky investments, they have limited risk, since they believe they will be bailed out. Seems so. So by government providing an implicit guarantee to bail out the large banks, they are inducing risky behavior, which costs the taxpayers more than if they did not do so. I guess that's right. Now. Can we go back to your point that certain bankers and businessmen are making large amounts of money that you consider unfair? Sure. Can you explain to me why this is a bad thing? Because they don't need to make so much more money than the average person. But what do they do with the excess money they have? I don't know. I suppose they spend some of it buying things they don't need, like yachts, 
and they invest the rest to make even more money. This sounds dreadful. Yet by investing these funds, they're giving money to bankers and others to invest, which in turn is given to companies to expand, which results in the creation of jobs. Yeah, that's true. And by purchasing more things for themselves, aren't they sharing their wealth with others? No. They're just being greedy. They don't care about helping anyone but themselves. Perhaps, but by being greedy, aren't they, whether they are trying to or not, providing funds to other people who may not have so much wealth? Only to the owners of companies that don't need to exist, like yacht companies. But if someone buys a yacht, to use your example, aren't they really giving money to scores of people? I'm not following. Well, if you purchase a yacht there seem to be so many people who benefit. The employees of the company that sells the yacht, the workers who built the yacht, the workers who acquired and sold the raw materials used to construct the yacht, and the people employed in marketing the yacht, to name but a few. I suppose so. And this doesn't even take into account all of the people employed to service the yacht once it is purchased, the people who fuel it, the maintenance workers who keep it running, the dock workers who protect it, and on and on. I get your point. But what the rich mostly do is invest their money to make more money with other rich people. Like the owner of this coffee chain? Exactly. So he can open up more shops and employ more people? Yeah, but that isn't why he is doing it. He is just trying to make more money. I agree. Yet by pursuing more money, doesn't he aid others, such as those additional people he employs? I suppose so, but he isn't trying to help others. That's just a consequence of his being a capitalist. I couldn't say it better myself. Well, I think this capitalist should try to help the people, and not think only about himself. Well, perhaps all of us should think about the welfare of others. Yet in the final analysis, why do we care about the rich people's motives if they are doing good for society? Because they could do more for the people if they paid higher taxes to fund noble causes. I don't trust their judgment. I'd rather trust the government's judgment. So you are suggesting that instead of helping to create jobs for others by purchasing goods and investing in other companies, it would be better if the bankers and other rich were taxed more in order to increase government revenues. That's what I've been saying. Well, if those with money are taxed more, doesn't that mean they will have less money to invest in other companies, and less money to spend on purchasing goods? Sure. So what? Well. That would mean that there will be less money spent on goods and services, and fewer funds available for investment, so there will be less money available to help businesses grow. We need to make sure the right things are growing, especially once the capitalists won't invest in. And tell me, how will the government know which companies to invest in? It will give money to green industries, like clean energy, that the capitalist bankers refuse to invest in. Well. My understanding is that solar and other forms of clean energy have been around for over 40 years now, and many bankers still have not found that these companies are profitable to invest in. I gather you are glad that the government is taking the initiative to make investments in these clean energy companies, and taking risks with the people's money to do so, since the bankers are unwilling to do so. Exactly. Of course, should these investments fail, who pays? such as when the government provided $535 million in loan guarantees to Solyndra, which soon after declared bankruptcy and laid off 1,100 employees. What do you mean? Who pays? If the government invests in companies that fail, I am asking who picks up the tab? Well, the government. And who pays for the government? The taxpayers. So, if bankers make investments that fail, only the bankers are on the hook, but if government makes investments that fail, all of the taxpayers are on the hook. That is why we need to make the bankers and other very rich pay more in taxes, so the other taxpayers do not need to bear the burden of government investments in noble causes, whether or not they prove to be profitable. Ah, so that the bankers can be forced to pay for failed government investments that they would not have otherwise chosen to invest in themselves? Yeah. Right on. Wow, this government investing sure is interesting. I am glad we have enlightened elected officials who have the intelligence to make socially conscious investment decisions, not to mention the insight to ensure that there is someone around to pay for any of their mistakes. Enlightened government officials rock. They ensure society is fair. And your view of fairness calls for having higher taxes on the rich than on other people? Of course. Tell me, why is this fair? 
Because they have more money. Why does it follow that it is fair to tax them more? Because they can afford to pay more. Yet I still do not understand why this makes taxing them fair. What do you mean? How did the rich make more money than the poor? Some have large inheritances, but most work by selling crap that others are dumb enough to buy, and then investing their profits to make more and more money. So they largely take their money by working for it and investing the proceeds. Yeah, that's right. So why does government have a right to their money? Because everyone is obligated to pay for government. Is this because everyone benefits from government providing national security, the courts and public safety for the people? That's correct, and government gives us our rights. Actually, as we discussed earlier, the people have rights and established governments to help protect them. Whatever. What else does the government do? It funds programs for the people and invests in noble ventures. And who do these programs and investments benefit? All of the people. Let's assume so. If the government is providing services to everyone, why isn't it fairest for everyone to pay the same amount for government? Because not everyone can afford to do so. So wouldn't it be fairest for everyone to pay an equal amount, except for those who cannot afford to pay at all? That would place an unfair burden on the less wealthy who have less to spend. Actually, it would most likely limit the size and cost of government, because if everyone was required to pay the same amount, those required to pay a higher percentage of their income, those less wealthy, would fight to minimize the cost of government, so they could keep more of the money they earned. That would suck. Furthermore, on the subject of fairness, if you purchase a loaf of bread, the price does not vary based on whether you are richer or poorer. So why should the cost of government services vary based on one's wealth? Look, the rich can afford to pay more, so the many people who aren't wealthy have a right to take more of the money of the fewer who are wealthy. So the question of fairness comes down to who has the strength of numbers. The people have needs, and the wealthy need to be forced to do their part to meet the needs of the people. This is an interesting view of fairness. Very Stalinistic. Now tell me, beyond the companies the government invests in, you said government will use higher taxes on the rich to subsidize people who need more money. Yeah. The government will ensure everyone will get the same amount of funds, or at least, everyone will have a livable wage. Ah, this gets back to our discussion of government helping everyone finish the race together. Can you help me understand why there are some people who are more wealthy and others that are less wealthy? It's pretty straightforward. The rich get rich by charging too much for the stuff they sell, and through getting handouts from their friends in Washington. Like the heads of Salandra. No, no, no. But what the people that Salandra received weren't handouts, they were, um, government loan guarantees to undertake a noble venture. I am not clear on the distinction you make between handouts and government guarantees, but I'm willing to move on if this topic troubles you. In any event, are you saying that the reason businessmen and bankers get rich is because the people pay too much for their goods and services, coupled with their receiving corporate welfare from the government? Yeah. I certainly agree that corporate welfare seems to be unfair, as it is government giving handouts to one group of people and not doing so for others. Right on. Yet in terms of businesses and banks overcharging for goods and services, didn't we already discuss that the amount people are charged is limited by competition? Yes, but big businessmen can still make a lot of money even if they make small profits on each sale, by selling products to thousands if not millions of people. So your concern is not that companies charge too much, but rather that they make a great deal of profit if they are successful, and you see this as unfair. Why do you see this as unfair? Because they don't deserve the money. Why not? Because they don't need it. Why not? Because no one needs several mansions, planes, cars and all of the rest, especially when most people have so little. We seem to agree that we want to have a fair society, in which everyone has what they deserve, and no one takes things that don't belong to them. Do we agree? Absolutely. So we should examine why people get what they have and how to be sure everyone gets what they deserve. We can, but it's really quite simple. Is it? Of course. Everyone should have the same amount of money, that's what is fair. And why is that fair? Because everyone has a right to a living amount. And why do they have this right? Are you crazy? Because they are human beings, with self-dignity. So if someone is a human being, whether or not they work hard, they should be entitled to the same amount of money? Of course. 
Yet does self-dignity stem from being given things or from earning them? Well, not everyone has the same opportunities to earn. Perhaps not. Yet does not dignity come from one knowing that they earned what they received, rather than through receiving a handout? Put another way, does not dignity come from knowing your gains stem from your own labor? I guess so. And from society's standpoint, is not some labor worth more than other labor? What do you mean? Well, should the person who invents a cell phone be paid about the same amount as someone who works at a bank? No. Bankers suck. So they should be paid less. Well, I thought you were saying everyone should be paid about the same amount. Not bankers, they suck. Hmm. So you are now saying that some people should be paid less than others. How do we know which people should be paid less? Well, those who contribute the most to society should earn more than those who are leeches, like the bankers. Ah, so people who contribute the most should be paid more than those who don't contribute. Yeah, that's right. And how do we know who is contributing and who is not? That's easy. Those who are contributing make into things that are useful and those who are not contributing to things that are not useful. So the people who are not doing what is useful should not be paid? No, I didn't say that. Everyone should be paid a living wage. We have to show our concern for all of the people. Even those bankers who you say suck. Well, we should reform society so there are no more bankers and then the people who today work in banks could do more useful work to earn a wage, like I do, through community organizing. Hmm, tell me, because I still don't fully understand. Are you now saying that everyone should be given a wage but not necessarily the same wage? Yeah. And how do we decide how much everyone should make? Well first, we have to make sure that no one makes an obscene wage. And what constitutes an obscene wage? No one should make so much that they are buying private jets, or houses on the Hamptons, or yachts. So should we take these things away from Sean Penn? Will you get off his back? You keep forgetting the problem is the rich bankers and businessmen. But I thought you said that no one should be able to afford these luxury items. Let it go, man. Let's move on. All right. Well, can you tell me whether, under your salary proposal, everyone who tries their best should receive about the same amount of money? Yeah. Regardless of whether what they do is productive? Huh? Let's say a woman behind the counter who is making your drink makes twice as many drinks in a day as the man on the next shift. Should the man and woman be paid the same? Well, if they both are trying their hardest, they should. So are you saying that people should be paid according to their degree of effort, as well as whether what they produce is of value? That's right. So if you have two basketball players and one player scores far more points per game and plays far better defense than a second player, should they both be paid the same? I guess not. But what if both players are working just as hard as one another? Should they be compensated the same amount? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. The reason I want to understand this is because you said earlier that we need to be fair. I want to understand what this means, as well as to understand who should have the authority to make the determination of what is fair on a case-by-case -case basis. Why? Because if you are proposing that government subsidizes people to ensure fairness, don't we first need to know who is deserving of being subsidized? and how to determine the appropriate amount to subsidize them, in order to be fair? Listen, I don't know the particulars, but to me what's fair is giving to those who need more, by paying them with the money of those who make more, so that everyone has a living wage. So maybe you are now saying that everyone should be guaranteed a minimum salary by the government, independent of their productivity or degree of effort. I guess so. And this would be fair because... Because everyone has a right to a certain standard of living. I am intrigued by your definition of a right. Are you saying that a person who works very hard to earn a subsistence living, and another able-bodied person who refuses to work at all, should both be guaranteed the same standard of living? Well, some people are not able-bodied. That is true. There are persons with limitations who are unable to work, and I think one can make an argument that it may be just that they receive support because they are unable to care for themselves. Yeah. Yet sticking to the example at hand, do you think it is fair for an able-bodied person who chooses not to work to be provided the same standard of living as a person who chooses to work and earn a subsistence wage? That's a tough question. Is it not in some ways similar to a banker who receives protection from the government? Like a banker. The poor and need are nothing like the bankers. Yet if the government bails out a banker who makes irresponsible investing decisions, 
Is that not similar to bailing out a citizen who is irresponsible and not willing to work to earn a living? They are not the same thing. It is true, they are not exactly the same thing. Yet in both cases the government is incenting irresponsible behavior. What is the alternative? To let people earn what they can in the marketplace by giving producers and consumers the freedom to decide what each person should be paid for their labor. Well, that may sound good in theory. And in practice? In practice, it leads to inequality, because not everyone can perform as well as everyone else. That is true, but isn't inequality fair? How is it fair? Because people's compensation is tied to what the people are willing to pay for their work. There's a big problem with that kind of thinking. What is that? People who have freedom may compensate others for things that they don't really need, and can make some people terribly rich. We agree. People who have freedom may choose to purchase things that are bad for themselves, and allow others to make unspeakable wealth through their purchases. Freedom requires people to be responsible for their own actions, or minimally, to accept the consequences of their decisions, both good and bad. If the government doesn't highly regulate commerce and we leave things up to the marketplace, some people won't hire or buy products from others due to their race, color, gender or other similar characteristics. They will discriminate. They may. Yet don't people who discriminate in such ways do harm to themselves? What do you mean? They do harm to those they discriminate against. Well, let's say you were of Chinese descent and happen to be a great basketball player. Some people may refuse to hire you due to discrimination, or the feeling that the Chinese can't play basketball as well as other groups. Exactly. Yet those who don't care about such factors, and are only concerned with the quality of a player's skills, may gain a talented player who will help them win many games, like when the Brooklyn Dodgers hired Jackie Robinson, and other baseball teams were too bigoted to do so. Yeah, bigots suck. Yet because of their bigotry, they paid a price, by missing out on one of the best baseball players around. The Dodgers on the other hand, prospered. But not everyone is a star athlete. True. But don't we believe that every able-bodied person has some talent that is of value to the marketplace? Yeah, but there are still bigots who make it more difficult for some people to get a fair shake. Sure there are. Yet this did not prevent a black man from being elected president of the United States. No, but what does this have to do with the marketplace? Well, the marketplace is like an election, or rather a series of elections. Sellers competitively vie to sell products and services to buyers. The buyers vote for the products and services they want with their dollars. The sellers who best meet the desires of the buyers, while most efficiently controlling their costs, earn the greatest profits. Marketplace elections are fair, provided they are not rigged by government or other third parties intervening to restrict free trade, or through subsidizing the buyers or sellers. I know the government subsidizes sellers, like when they give money to bankers, but when do they subsidize buyers? Well. Programs like Cash for Clunkers subsidize buyers through paying consumers so they can purchase vehicles at below market prices. This leads many consumers to buy cars when they otherwise would not. Is that a bad thing? The American automobile industry and its workers are in trouble? Well, above and beyond directing tax dollars to subsidies, tax dollars that might be spent to pay already existing government obligations. It distorts the marketplace by incenting buyers to purchase cars instead of other goods and services that they would have bought, if automobiles were not subsidized. So, so by choosing to artificially create winners like the automobile industry, the subsidies can currently create losers, like the companies that miss out on sales, since consumers purchasing cars need to reduce the amount of money they spend on buying other products. Huh? That's an interesting way of looking at things. Hey listen. I've got to get going. It's time for me to get to my rally. Well, we will have to continue our discussion on another day. I still have some questions about what constitutes fairness. Good luck, as you attempt to make society a better place. And remember Hippocrates. Who's he? Back in the day, he was a doctor who said that when trying to help others, it is first important to avoid doing harm. Well, sure. That's obvious. People back then must have been pretty backward. Some merely felt it important to understand the consequences of their ideas before acting upon them. Well, I don't need to understand anymore, I know I'm right. Be mindful, Barrio, of what you think you know to be true. Things are not always as they appear on the surface, 
and what is emotionally pleasing may not prove to be just. May heaven help us, and may God bless America.